And thank you for inviting me to talk about my new book. It's an honor to be here along with the real experts on Project Diana. So for the sake of anyone I've dragooned into attending my talk who might not know about Project, Project Diana, here's the Cliff Notes version. Uh, during World War II, my father worked as a civilian employee of the Army Signal Corps doing research on radar at Camp Evans near Neptune, New Jersey, which is why I was born there and where I lived until I was 13. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, at the end of the war, the staffing was being sharply reduced and many of the military employees uh, were about to be decommissioned. At that point, the director of Camp Evans, not seeing much here, uh, uh, Lieutenant Colonel John DeWitt, with just a few months left to go, was tasked with determining whether Russian ICBMs venturing into the ionosphere could be detected with ra radar, which many believed was impossible. And since he didn't have any Russian missiles to practice on, he decided to aim his radar at something that was decidedly was there, namely the moon. Uh, this was, in fact, a long time dream of his, a feat, as we've heard already, he'd attempted earlier without success. And he knew a second chance when he saw one. No, maybe, no, maybe. So uh, with a very small team of men, and yes, they were all men, and a limited budget, DeWitt set to work. And on January 10th, 1946, they succeeded. At that time, this was a very big deal, making headlines all over the world and newsreels in movie theaters. It was the birth of radar astronomy, the first ex extraterrestrial communication, and it was also the start of the Cold War. And this is what we're all here to do, celebrate the 75th anniversary of this event. And with that, I'm gonna go ahead and try to start my slideshow here. Let's see. Okay. And Cindy, is, do you have slides, Cindy? Yes, I do. Can you see you, them? Uh, no. Wait, uh, not really. I can see them on my screen, but let me. Yeah, so you, you need to go to share screen. Yeah, ah, there it is. Okay, and now I have to get into slideshow. Wait from start. There. There you go. You're yeah. good. Okay. Um, okay, so um, this is my dad at around the, the time he worked for Project Diana. He was the chief scientist on the team, but as I said, the overall head of the project and the director of Camp Evans at that time was Jack DeWitt. My father was always very clear that DeWitt was no figurehead leader. He was a skilled engineer who had learned a lot from his earlier attempt at a moon bounce. So Jack was very much a hands-on part of the project from start to finish. My father was the head of something called the Special Development Section at Camp Evans, and the remaining group of engineers drawn from Matt Poole were Herbert Kaufman, Jack Moffinson, and Harold Webb. Stadler, Kaufman, and Moffinson were classified as radar engineers, radio, sorry, radio engineers. Webb was classified as a physicist, and he was the only one with a doctoral degree. These were the men who did the day-to-day -day work of designing, assembling, and testing the equipment, the transmitter, receiver, antenna, etc., needed to carry out the project. Other units at Camp Evans were drawn on, drawn into the project at, to varying degrees over the course of the project to provide expert input or technical assistance at various times along the way. The most notable by far would be the mathematical analysis section headed by Walter McAfee. I don't know when he started working with the engineering team. It was probably early on, uh, but certainly during the actual moon bounce phase, he was involved on a daily basis because he heard the calculations had to be redone specific to the position of the Earth and the moon on that at a given point in time. So you'll be hearing more about him later. So. Uh, including from one of my fellow Project Diana legacies. Uh, some other contributors uh, were less successful. The antenna design section, for example, submitted a design that was very clever, but unfortunately couldn't be made to work. 
So the project Diana engineers were thrown back on their own resources and had to come up with a design themselves resulting in the famous bed spring antenna made up of the, as you've heard of two SCR 271 antennas cobbled together. And my dad, by the way, always regarded the SCR 270 and 271 as very reliable radars that often worked well when newer, fancier models didn't. So you can see the bed spring antenna. You've seen it several times before if you've been with us all morning uh, here on the cover of my book. This is, of course, as, uh, not the antenna we've been using today. Uh, but the iconic bed spring, spring, which will surely be on the Project Diana stamp if one is ever issued, that was the dream of the late David Mockinson, has long since disappeared into the dustbin of history. Uh, having mentioned David, a word or two about me and my fellow Di uh, Project Diana legacies. All our fathers were very young. My father was 31 at the time with the moon bounce and Herbert Kaufman, Jack Moffinson and Walter McAfee were all just about the same age. That was a vintage year, I guess. Harold Webb was three or four years older and Jack DeWitt was barely 40. So a few of their children may recall the event itself, but most of us probably have only fleeting memories, if any. I was just short of three years old uh, whoops. Uh, these pictures are from around that time. My little sister Leslie was about to turn one, and my other two siblings, Sherry and Bob, had not yet been born. So, and this is it for your day, dose of baby cuteness, cuteness I promise. Um, having mentioned David, uh, he was my first playmate and sadly now lost from my numbers, but he actually did remember some of the hullabaloo surrounding the event. But a magazine devoted to eyewitness accounts of historical events turned down his submission on the grounds that a three-year-old couldn't possibly remember something like that. I believe in 100% because while I don't remember Project Diana, I do remember other things from that era in my life. And uh, he and I were the same age. He was one two weeks before I was. But well, whether we remember the event or not, most of our childhoods were steeped in Project Diana lore, and most of us have inherited documents, papers, books, and various other souvenirs. And all of us remember our fathers. I'm currently trying to reach out to the main legacy so we could uh, pool our memories and share our own special perspectives. And it sounds like Lori's doing that too, so maybe we can uh, sort of combine forces. So back to my journey in writing this book. Okay, sometime in the late 1990s, a friend who knew my father had been a radar scientist told me about a review she'd read in her husband's MIT alumni magazine, a book by Robert Boudry called the invention that changed the world, how a small group of radar pioneers won the Second World War and launched a technological revolution. It sounded like the perfect way for me to learn more about Project Diana. So I hurried right out and uh, bought the book. Unfortunately, the small group of radar engineers uh, in his subtitle turned out to be the MIT Rad Lab, not Project Diana. In fact, Project Diana takes up just about a little over three pages in his book. And the only reason it's mentioned at all is the inconvenient truth that they managed to do something that the uh, Rad Lab perhaps should have done, but didn't, namely uh, shoot the moon and succeed. So, uh, Boudry provided endless amusement to my siblings and me by referring to our dad as the diminutive bespectacled evening stoddler. Now, my father wasn't a big man, but we had never thought of him as particularly diminutive, and neither did anyone else, to my knowledge. Only later did I figure out how he must have come up with this description. Well, here's the photo of the five engineers that you've seen before and was widely published, publicized at the time, with my father, with the light of the wit in the photo. He's the shortest one, but 
okay, someone has to be the shortest. So nevertheless, I got in touch with Bob Booty. And although Project Diana was pretty much tangential to the research he'd done for the book, he was very kind and helpful. And he did me the inestimable favor of connecting me with the amazing friend Carl, whom you're going to hear from later, and prevent fledgling infoids, without which I probably never have written this book or done any of the things that led up to it. To explain what came next, I, I have to tell you that my father always felt that Project Diana never received the recognition it uh, deserved. At every milestone year, 35th, 40th, etc., he tried to drum up interest in a public celebration, and he would sort of see, succeed, but on a local level. And here's a couple of examples. From the 35th anniversary uh, in the Asbury Park Press, he and Walter McAfee are reminiscing on, about Project Diamond. And the other one uh, is uh, from the 40th anniversary. He was living in Florida, time, Florida at the time. And, uh, that one. So that article appeared in the his open uh, newspaper there. But overall, the army only provided lukewarm support and my father never succeeded in inspiring the gala celebration he had in mind. Was it because Jack DeWitt didn't quite get around to asking permission to fulfill his assigned task of, of detecting Russian ICBMs by shooting the moon? That never seemed quite like an adequate explanation for the army gray out of Project Diana. And I actually found it quite puzzling until with a little hint from a reader, I think I actually surmised at such least uh, resolved that mystery, and you can read about it in my book, but here's a clue. Later, when he worked at the Pentagon, my dad was denied access to his own work on Project Diana because his level, his level of security clearance wasn't high enough at that time. So here's a picture of my dad and stepmother around the time of the 40th anniversary, and as you'll see, not quite so diminutive anymore. So fast forward to somewhere early in the 2010s when I decided to try to bring my father and his colleagues some of the recognition he'd hoped for by creating a Project Diana website. As far as I know, it's still the only website devoted exclusively to Project Diana and it needs a little updating at the moment, which I hope to get to shortly now that I've got the book more or less out. Then on January 10th, 2016, which would be the 70th anniversary and, uh, of the Moon Bounce, and five years ago today, I added a blog to the website. And that quickly turned into the tail that wagged the dog because it turned out to be so darn much fun to do. I managed to thread my way through a lot of fairly challenging topics, including the bed spring antenna, Armstrong's work, uh, during World War II with a little extra help from Ray Chase and Al Clays and Operation Moon Bounce uh, in which drawing on lessons from Project Diana, the moon was used by the military as a communication satellite for many years until they started uh, shooting up artificial satellites. I also learned quite a lot about the second moon shot Apollo 11, when I asked myself the question, what, if anything, had been learned about the moon itself from Project Diana? I also learned quite a bit about my father's work on the development of techniques to de detect kamikaze flights, which are in fact, probably what he'd be best remembered for if Project Diana had never happened. He later wrote that this earlier work on moving target detection had prepared him well for Project Diana where their task was to detect a very large and very distant moving target. It also foreshadowed the approach that he used with Project Diana, as I like to put it, work rapidly, using materials already on hand, modify as, as needed, and then test, test, test. He did a lot of the simulation for the Kamikaze project in a mountainous region in upstate New York near the town of Ellenville, which apparently had just the right configuration for testing methods to distinguish low-flying aircraft from the background clutter 
and thus eliminate the radar blind spot, spot that the Japanese had learned to ex exploit. I wasn't even born at the time, but I do remember this taking quite a few trips to Ellenville later, so I guess it continued to be an informative test site. But I knew from the beginning that I wouldn't be able to write essay after essay on technical subjects without uh, quickly getting out of my wheelhouse. I also thought it would be interesting to explore Project Diana's historical, sociological, political, and scientific context as seen from the perspective of the tiny coastal town uh, where fate in the form of Camp Evans deposited my father and their neighbors. So I interspersed my essays described above with essays about my father's family background, some of it gleaned from an oral history that I did with him in 1979. My only organizational principle was to vary my subject matter between essays, something for me. Uh, so here's a photo of my father with his father, with his two younger brothers and their dog, Sandy. And I also did quite a few uh, posts on my Jersey Shore childhood. Here's a photo I used in an essay called Growing Up in an Amusement Park. And that's me on the right, and three of my friends, um, with a Mary Glenn that uh, was beautiful and no longer exists. My mother made several well-deserved appearances in my blog. My file name for this particular JPEG file is Elsa and King, Happy Couple, because they really had an unusually harmonious marriage. Unfortunately, she died at the age of 52 when I had only recently uh, graduated from college and there were two minor children still living at home. Our family had truly lost its rubber. So here's a picture I used in an essay about our friends, the Evers family's cars. They're convertible with a rumble seat, and this one, the, the Willie's Jeep. Those lucky ducks had all the good cars. Um, this show, slide shows some of my childhood activities. Archie, my beloved pet parakeet, is a Christmas gift obtained at the local Woolworths during a parakeet craze. I fully expected him to learn to talk but his gauge was kept right over the telephone and the only uh, phrase he ever succeeded in learning to say was Asbury part two, which was the telephone exchange that he started out with after the operator said number please. So he heard that often enough to learn. The middle one is my Tony doll, which I still have along with uh, a lot of the clothes my mother made for her, including this jaunty little jumpsuit. Um, Tony's hair could actually be home permed. So this is an early example of advertising to moms through their children. And the third, playing my ukulele, another Christmas gift and another 1950s craze that seemed to keep, seems to keep bubbling up again and again over the every few decades. That actually turned out to be a fascinating story in which Arthur Godfrey, for those of you old enough to remember the old redhead plays a starring role. I also delved into the fascinating history of the village we lived in, Sharkover Hills, a resort of largely second homes that the army, by adding a few macadam roads, turned into a sleeper community for Camp Evans, close enough to be reached by car or even by bicycle. This is the Cracker Barrel, Sharkover Hills' only year-round store, looking pretty much as I remember it. It's now larger and more upscale and part of the chain, which I don't think it was at the time, but it's still in the very same place where I rode my bike when I had a few extra pennies in my pocket to spend on the candy bar. This is the old Marconi Hotel, as you can see it today, but it was the first major building on the Camp Evans site built by Marconi for his workers when he chose the site as being perfect or well suited, at least to his efforts to achieve transatlantic radio communication. I took an interesting walk down memory lane in 2017 when my father was inducted into the InfoAge Wall of Fame 
And I realized that as a child, I'd never been inside this or any other Camp Evans building, ever. I clearly remember waiting with my mom and sister in the car for my father to come out. I guess I thought my father didn't go in to fetch him because she didn't want to leave her two little girls alone in the car. Only later did I realize that their work was considered top secret by the army and she wouldn't have been welcome inside either. So this is one of my favorite uh, Camp Evans pictures and Camp Evans topics. These are Dymaxion deployment units or DDUs designed by Richard Buckminster Fuller long before he became orders of magnitude more famous for the GADs of Dome. They were originally intended as prefabricated bomb-proof shelters, but they were also intended for storage, small well workshops, and even vacation cottages, prompting headlines like a shelter in war, a beach house in peacetime. The army ordered 100 or so for camp, the Camp Evans site, I think only some of which were delivered, and of which fewer than a dozen remain. They looked pretty shabby when we were there in 2017, but I'm told that InvoAge is now busy restoring the outsides and refurbishing one uh, both inside and out. As Project Diana's uh, 75th anniversary approached, I started thinking about what I might do to observe this milestone. I already knew that the postage stamp option was out because postage stamps can only commemorate anniversaries ending in zero. So David Moffins and Scream was out of the question. But by this time, I'd written about four dozen essays on my blog, and I thought this might be the right time to try to pull, pull them together into a book. What better did I have to do at a time when I was staying at home 24 seven? And what could be easier, I thought, than to rearrange them by topic and plug in a few photos? Well, this is the arrangement I finally ended up with, but it turned out not to be easy at all for three reasons. First, because I had arranged, uh, because when I arranged them by topic, I found that there was a certain amount of repetition that no one would ever notice reading the essays a couple of years apart, but became painfully apparent when they were presented cheek by jowl. That involved a fair amount of editing and what writers refer to as uh, the painful process of killing your darlings, that is jettison, jettison whole paragraphs or more of your laboriously crafted prose. I probably didn't catch them all, but presumably I'll do better by the second edition. Second, once I dove into the task, I decided that many, if not most of the essays needed updating and in some instances major reworking. For some essays, I sought additional expert readers, and that too could require me adding new information. Third, of the many topics I hadn't yet gotten to, uh, there were a few that I really, really wanted to address. So I had either to incorporate them into already existing essays or to write something new. Then, as uh, at the last minute, Diana Webb, another of my legacies, and those of you who this morning already saw this, uh, uh, sent me uh, this comic book uh, feature from Picture News Comics uh, in 1946, right after the moon bounce, which I knew I had to write up as Harold Webb's superhero, with a little background on the history of comic books. As you see, the title promises nothing short of round, a round trip to Mars, which I sort of assumed came from the writer of the book, not directly from Hal Webb. I'm not sure about that. So I'm telling you all this about my problems be, just because I wanted you to know I'm not trying to get you to buy a book that you can read for free on the internet. I think even my most avid followers will find it's quite a different and more comprehensive reading experience. So there was only one possible name for this book, of course, To the Moon and Back, which I have to say describes my book much more precisely than it does most of the other books with similar titles. It's sort of sui generis, but to the extent that it's anything, it's a book of essays, as the subtitle indicates, not a continuous narrative. 
and the ebook is now available on Amazon in the Kindle store and the paperback should be out by the end of the month. And uh, I welcome any uh, notification of any errors in either grammar or spelling or in content. And please let me know because I'm always happy to make changes. And if you like the book, please consider leaving a review on Amazon.